Now this is the version that rock the nation with a solid vibration. You are not far from the station, so take out your added vacation. Yeah, yeah, yeah! No one ever can understand it. The way the system planned. There's no hope, no chance, no loophole, no escape for a sufferer man. I just do way that the Babylon planet. For I to find it in everyone every day. I don't do follow that little Satan boy. You need to change myself, don't really gonna lead you astray. Still I'm putting up a resistance. Yeah. I'm gonna work it out. Alright, this is uh, Ryan. It's been a while since I've made any videos for Behind Time Curtain, but I have resurrected that website and several others just in the last year. Um, Behind Zion Curtain has been down for many years. No website there at all. Um, basically, I had redirected it to a archive of the website through archive.org, which you can find my archives there. They go all the way back to 1999. Uh, my biographies there and other things. Uh, in this conversation today, it inspired me to talk about that, that biography, and uh, that's what made me um, think about making a video. And so, yes, I, I have had a problem with Sharia law. I don't have a problem with Muslims. I've worked with a few Muslims, uh, worked with one sp uh, specifically uh, who wasn't from the Middle East, but was a con convert to Islam and was a very nice guy, got along with him very well. I don't have a problem with religion in general. What I have a problem with is the violent behavior of these refugees coming from other countries. I mean, you can see them in um, in London. Well, in fact, I made a whole bunch of posts here just to just to demonstrate it uh, because there is so many um, examples. Just a crazy amount of violence where they're protesting in favor of Sharia law and they start throwing rocks at people and they start really uh, getting hostile. Yeah, see these uh, Muslim attacks a Christian preacher in the USA. American Muslims stone Christians in Dearborn, Michigan. Muslims attack Christians leaving church. Cameraman attacked by Muslims in America. I mean, this is all over the place. You, you can see mass demonstrations of thousands of Muslims. You can see them in, uh, is it, I can't remember uh, the exact town in London. I, I had it on the tip of my tongue, but I forget it. But there's a little area of London that they have taken over, these people that believe in Sharia law. And uh, London has basically, you know, secluded them there. Like, they don't, they don't uh, go, the police don't go in. You know, they, they uh, don't, you know, uh, moder moderate any violence or anything. The police just leave them alone, let them do whatever they want. They've basically taken over big areas of London and Paris and other places, and they're they're uh, living Sharia law in these places. I mean, they have mass violence. They have, you know, uh, you know, women who don't wear their burqas and they whip them in public. They just, you know, violently whip them in public and, and abuse people. And I don't agree with that. But this um, a couple of these people are like, well, you know, the, the fact is, is that this is a lot like Christianity. If you read the Old Testament, it says this, this and that. And, you know, I had to correct atheist at Hempfest, and you can see this video. I'll link it. Um, you can you can watch how I had to correct these people. The, the New Testament and the Old Testament are different, just like Jews and Christians are different. Um, yeah, they have similar origins, but Christ came to bring grace and peace and love and to fulfill the Old Testament laws. And it all started in basically Exodus 22 through 24, um, Exodus 24 talks about the two covenants, the, the one that uh, Moses originally bring, but when he came down to where Aaron and the Israelites were, they were dancing around a golden idol and they were um, dancing naked and sinning against God and rebelling against God. And, and so, you know, Moses was like, hey, forget about it and busted the tablets, went back up, talked to God. God's like, hey, and this isn't, you know, word for word and, you know, it's not specifically defined this way, but, it, you know, the end result was like, Hey, God's like, hey, you know what? If they don't want me, if they want to turn their backs on me, they don't need me. You know, I just freed them from slavery. I just led them through the desert. I fed them for 40 years. I, I gave them manna. You know, if they still want to rebel against me, then fine. I don't I don't need to pine for their attention. You know, if they want me, they can come to me. I'm turning my back. I'm walking away. That's fine. And uh, so Moses basically continued to be the shepherd of this fold. Now, the Israelites didn't need to subscribe to Moses. They could have went their own way. They could have, you know, ventured off to a new land. They could have started their own communities. But if they decided to stay with Moses, they had to live by 
the law of Moses. Now, when we talk about the Mosaic law or the, you know, law of Moses, we are talking about the law of Moses, which if you read in Hebrews 7 of the Bible, Paul called it unprofitable, weak, uh, it made no one perfect. It did nothing good, basically. Um, and that Christ came with his sacrifice to fulfill the law. And this is a common theme from start to end. And, uh, you know, they keep going on and on in this conversation about, oh, yeah, well, you know, some Christians do believe the Old Testament is doctrine. Well, yeah, and mostly those people call themselves Mormons or they're, you know, fanatical extremists, but they don't, you know, really get the Bible, because there's hundreds of verses that say Christ's purpose, he didn't just come to be like, you know, this peace, love, hippie guy. Christ came for one purpose, and that was to fulfill the law and to bring grace, and he had to do that with his sacrifice. That's why the sacrifice is a pivotal part of the ministry of Christ, and the, you know, one of the main focuses of the Bible in the New Testament is his sacrifice. His sacrifice completed the atonement requirements of what they spoke about in Exodus 20 through 24. The, um, the uh, birthright of Aaron and the priesthood of Aaron was to officiate the altar of sacrifice, which required blood. And you can read through all the way to Exodus even 28. Exodus 28 speaks clearly about this priesthood and the um, qualifications of the priesthood and the purpose of the priesthood. And it was all about a sacrifice. And the priest would go into the holies of holies once a year, and he would offer his sacrifice first for himself and then for the people. And he would cover the sin in blood, which was a requirement, you know, of basically Moses's law to uh, atone for sin. And it never really did anything for anyone. And that's what the New Testament says specifically. And it, it says that almost word for word in Hebrews 7, that the law made nothing perfect, that it was weak and unprofitable. It wasn't, it wasn't worth you know, the time it took to do those sacrifices because it did nothing to bring people to repentance or to God's will. It, it did really uh, no good at all. Um, and, and so, yes, uh, the Old Testament had been fulfilled by Christ's blood. If you accept it and you believe in that grace, then you're not under the old law. You know, you're not under the Old Testament. If you don't believe it, if you don't accept Christ's sacrifice, then I could see why people would you know, cling on to that old law, like the Mormons. The Mormons are very keen to that old law. Um, and, you know, he says right here, you, whatever, you can cry ignorance of Christian doctrine all you want. It doesn't change the fact that all the major denominations take both the Old Testament and New Testament to be the literal word of God. Funny enough, Christians of the world do, uh, do not follow the word of Friar Ryan, maybe because uh, people would take you seriously if you stop posting racist Islamophobic news laugh articles from comic conservative. And so I don't know what is racist here. When I say, get the fuck out of here, you scumbags, what I'm talking about is the Sharia law. This isn't a race thing. This is those who practice Sharia law. Now, like I said, I've worked with Muslims. I have had friends that are Muslims, people who don't subscribe to Sharia law or people who don't subscribe to Mormonism are, you know, rational people for the most part, the people that I know in these religions that don't go to the extremes of, hey, you're a homosexual, I'm going to kill you, or hey, you've had adultery in your life, I'm going to kill you, or you didn't have your burqa on in public, you're going to get whipped. You know, if they're not that crazy, then I don't have a problem with them. It's not a racist thing. Um, the person that I, I uh, worked with was a convert to Muslim. He was a white guy. You know, I'm a white guy, so how could I, how could it be a racist thing uh, when Islam accepts all races? Islam isn't about race. This guy is who makes it racist, the Zach Anderson guy. And that's, that's what I find silly um, is, you know, when people can't debate well, they go to that racist thing. And that's, that's what this is right here. It says in this mem, and I love this mem, I post this every once in a while, because liberals usually result to this. Um, he says, are you losing the debate? Shout racist, and you silence the opposition, which ends the argument, allowing you to claim victory. Um, and he mentions, oh, well, you were a skinhead. And uh, so, yes, uh, 23 years ago, I lived with a couple of skinhead guys. And 
after that, I got some anti-racist tattoos. I got this right here on my chest that says spear, means skins and punks everywhere against racism. I have the same thing on my foot. It says spear, and it it's the same thing. It means skins and punks everywhere against racism. Uh, my wife is Cherokee, Native American. My kids are Native American. Um, you know, if I was this big racist guy, you know, like Charles Darwin was. I mean, Charles Darwin was a was a terrible racist. You can read about how he thinks the white race was more evolved than the Turks, perhaps, and that, you know, the weaker races would be beat out by the white race. I mean, this is Charles Darwin for you. Um, you know, if I was, you know, a racist, why would I go and marry somebody that is not, you know, a pure white woman or whatever, you know, or have kids that are not pure white kids or whatever. I mean, racism is stupid. And when I got my tattoos on my body, I was 17 when I got this one, um, you know, that says spear, skins and punks everywhere against racism. And the one that was on my foot, I got, uh, I think I was 18. No, I got this one when I was 18 because I got this one from a tattoo shop and I had to be 18 to get it. And I got the one on my foot when I was 17 because I did it myself because I couldn't go to a tattoo shop at the time because I was too young. Um, so anyway, I mean, my whole entire life, I have dedicated myself to being against racism and against the teachings of the Mormon church, which were highly racist. Um, and another problem here is that he continues to say, well, and, and other people will say this, if you're a disciple of Christ, then you're a Christian. And I don't claim to be a Christian because I don't believe in groupthink or mob mentality. I just don't. And I've, you know, I left the Mormon church when I was 20. I was 19 or 20. I wrote my bishop and I got my name removed from the Mormon records and I left the Mormon church officially. I was way gone before that. I never really subscribed to the Mormon church. But part of it was because of their racist doctrine. I didn't believe in it then. I don't believe in it now. And it's one thing I've always fought against. And uh, I'll put a couple of links to the things that I have said in my life about that. Um, I wrote my biography. It's um, You have to go to archive.org uh, and you can look up my biography um, that I wrote. And I addressed that in my biography. That This was written in 1999 and updated in 2002. Um, but if you go to mystory.behindzioncurtain.com here on the Internet Archive, so mystory.behindzioncurtain.com, and you can see my biography, and I address that um, quite a bit. And I did, uh, you know, I, I have some uh, history in my life that I, I felt, um, you know, I needed to repent for. And I talked a lot about it. I, I took uh, responsibility for myself and for things I've done in life. And I did address the skinhead topic. It's not it's not hard to find, you know, my uh, history with that. And yeah, at one time I did live with racist skinheads um, when I was like 14 years old. It was my cousin's boyfriend, but I never subscribed to it. And as soon as I was able to educate myself, I found out the history of skinhead goes all the way back to the UK and it started out with blacks, whites, everybody, and they were just working class people who shaved their heads and listened to ska music and reggae music. And that's the origins of skinhead. If you if you just Google on um, the topic, you can look up the spirit of 1969. And this is the origins of skinhead. And ever since I was 17 years old, this is what I've subscribed to. And, uh, you know, this is about the skinheads. But if you, you know, look at the the people, um, the skinhead people, some of them are black, some of them are white. If you look up Mr. Simarip, he was one of the originals. He's a black skinhead, uh, you know, and, and he was in a bunch of skinhead bands and was one of the fathers of skinhead. And so, I, I mean, yeah, they, they always go to that uh, racist thing if they if they can't win on the merit of logic, uh, a lot of these um, these liberals. That's just how they respond. That's just, that's just how they they like to end arguments is, oh, you racist, I can't believe you. Well, if that's the the strength of your argument, uh, you, ought to, you ought to strengthen it a little bit more because that's pretty weak.